everyone today. Thank you very much for joining us live. My name is Blair Campbell. I'm the head of industry development at the Fit Summit, and I'm honoured to moderate this session with our fabulous brand leaders as we discuss boutique fitness, rebuilding, re-engineering, and re-energising your business. Today, myself and the panelists will be discussing recent challenges, trends, future growth, strategies, and offers for how to not just survive, new technologies and investments, collaborations in our industry, and a future outlook. This session is being recorded, and it will be shared with all of you after the event so that you can watch it on demand if there's anything you want to know. Firstly, I want to welcome today's panelists to the discussion. We have with us today, go around the panelists one by one, so uh, if each of you can give a wave to the audience, we have the founder and CEO of Electric Studios. We also have with us Selena Bridge, this KX Pilates. We also have the CEO of the Pulse Fitness Group. We have Peter Hull, or the CEO of FitStop. And we have Sam Canavan, the GM for APAC. And class pass. Excellent. Thank you all for today. It's a having you. For those of us who are, for those of you who are watching and don't necessarily uh, know our panelists, then they have all left their details in the chat. Uh, they are recognized as some of the leading uh, industry experts on boutique fitness. Christina is recognized as one of the boutique fitness on growing electric studios in the last four years to having four studios, the Rhythm Boxing in 2020. Ele electric Studios is one of Manila's premier fitness destinations with a fast-growing cult-like following. And as a former consultant director, she drives deep mark. It's her passion that uh, fitness essentially changes and transforms lives, and that's how to uh, be. We're also joined today by Nathan Clute, who is the CEO of Pulse Fitness Group, bringing the best of boutique fitness to the Middle East, and ultimately an exclusive partner of One Rebel in the Middle East and North Africa. He is a senior advisor to Arma Sports, a leading organization in Saudi Arabia that plans 150 million health and fitness sector for the next five years. And he was the chief strategy officer to the largest fitness clubs in the Middle East with over locations. Tull is ultimately top Australia's leading innovative uh, fitness, sorry, functional fitness franchise. They are rapidly expanding throughout all of Australia and New Zealand. They are strongly backed by data uh, and ultimately have a results driven process. They are cost set up franchise with a highly engaged community and are on a mission to become Australia's most trusted fitness brand. Sam Canavan with ClassPass oversees Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, India, Thailand, Malaysia, and United Arab Emirates. He's in charge of the entire region's P&L, the studio and wellness venue franchises and partnerships, as well as the the most recent collaboration with Exponential Fitness. So he's well placed today to discuss brand collaborations. And also we have Selena, the CEO of KX, who is the, C the brand in both Australia and New Zealand with over 67 studios. They've also launched into Indonesia uh, and they have future plans launching to China, the USA, Singapore, and New Zealand. They have a fully accredited Platys Academy offering seven to trainers and ultimately they have they are the fastest growing franchises for boutique fitness in the Pacific. I'd like to welcome all of these amazing panelists to our discussion today and welcome the audience as we start today I'm going to ask the first question to our panelists which is that business owner or leader what is the single biggest challenge that you have had to overcome in the last few months. And I'm going to start this by asking Christina, who has recently had a baby, but has also been 
launching uh, the brand uh, uh, and expanding as well. Christina, over to you. <laughs> Um, having a baby is a huge challenge in itself, especially during this pandemic. I definitely underestimated the amount of work and sleepless nights involved. Um, but outside of that, um, really, it's really simple for us. The biggest challenge has been the disappearance, the sudden disappearance of our main revenue stream. Uh, when this lockdown happened, everything was going fantastic, right? We we were all, we were strongly into our fifth year. Um, we a month ago or two months before opened our fourth studio. Aggressively about to open our boxing concept, which was our second modality outside of indoor cycling. So everything was going well, um, and I'm sure everyone here knows like March is really strong for fitness. So when this whole thing happened, all of a sudden something we've never seen before was that disappearance of our main revenue stream. And we really had to figure out what we would do. Um, and actually right now in the Philippines, group fitness similar to New York City, we're still not allowed to operate. So we're still, um, our studios are still locked down. So when this happened in March, you know, it came fast, it came sudden. And the first thing we really had to do was just rally the troops, rally the managers, rally the instructors, really letting them know what we know and what we don't know, and really just communicating to them what our game plan was and making sure that everyone was steering in the right direction. Um, also, when this happened, something unique that happened to us is we weren't even allowed to mobilize. Um, so the first thing we had to do was how could we um, monetize again because we can't stay like this forever. So the first thing we did was we quickly launched our new modalities under electric. So we launched Rhythm Boxing online. Uh, we launched our flow program, our hip program, our strength training program because people didn't have equipment in their house. So we needed a way to still bring our um, brand outside and really cater to our community. And we were really surprised actually at how the community rallied behind us for concepts that we never introduced to them before. So I think it's really a huge testament, not just to the brand, but the credibility of our instructor team as well. Um, a few weeks after when we were able to mobilize, we simply just launched our whole fleet of bikes out there, brought them to the market, rented them out. Um, when that wasn't enough, we quickly partnered uh, with our friends over at Schwinn and Stages to really help support us just bring more bikes out to the market. And the reception was really fantastic. Um, people just wanted electric in their house. They wanted to ride again. They wanted to feel like they were a part of that community. So we overnight, became a transport logistics team, which are things we've never ever done before. Um, after that, we really had to think long and hard about our software. And the great thing about it is that since day one, we actually built our own proprietary software. So our booking system, our app, everything, we created that from scratch. So that really set us in a way where when this pandemic hit, we were quickly able to integrate our system, make the changes that we need, build our online on-demand platform, really with an electric customer in mind. Um, and that really helped us move as fast as possible. So really the, the biggest challenge is how we had to overnight transform ourselves into a brick and mortar studio that was only offering indoor cycling classes to really being a, digital fitness content software hardware provider, plus providing different modalities to the market. Um, it feels long, but it also feels short. I feel like this has been the toughest months for us, but I'm so thankful for the team that we've had. And it's really a testament to how much you could do with a small lean team, as long as you continue to be passionate about serving your community. Obviously, a lot of pivoting there, uh, and great to hear from from you how you've done that. Selena, would you mind answering the same question? What's been the greatest challenge for you of late? 
Um, and before I start, Claire, thank you so much for inviting myself and KX to the panel. It's great to be part of it with everybody. Um, KX, as a business, we've always been built on understanding our clients and helping our clients reach their potential, changing them for the better. We've been around for 10 years. In fact, this year marked our 10 year um, anniversary. And to Christina's point, we've had great success, great momentum. And the priority of the business has been really that personalization we can deliver in studio through our highly qualified and trained trainers and then supported with technology. Technology has helped us improve the experience, but our primary um, service is that through people and real life experiences. So like a quick sudden change into what we've always known, um, disruption. And that's, um, you know, we've got over 40 owners, over 400 trainers, over 40,000 active clients. There's a lot of people that this ch sudden change had to impact. Um, really, really proud both the team at HQ and also our owners and trainers who collaborated very, very quickly to turn around and provide a response. Our immediate thought was how can we connect with our clients? How can we deliver an element of personalization that that is what the clients want and the connection in a, in a way that we've never done that before. Very quickly had over a hundred um, online workouts, launched KX Live at Home, and I think the important thing is knowing that actually week after week, we kept on changing and improving, learning that, that constant innovation in terms of what we were delivering. It just never stopped. Every week there was just something new that the constant, how do we keep providing a better experience along the way? Um, so like everybody, that, that was a big change. But I think for me, again, recognizing the amount of different people and personalities and the way COVID has just affected everyone so differently, whether it's emotionally, financially, physically, it's just been unpredictable and not unanimous. So that's been a massive change for us. And we've got half of our network open, half of the network are still closed. So I think the big challenge now is really trying to realign everybody from clients, trainers, owners, employees, back into the natural brand that we are and get everyone back on that same page so that we can pick up, pick up the momentum sorry, from where we were. So um, yeah, I think, the emotional side and the uncertainty has been a big challenge when we're playing with with people as well. Great to hear. Pete, over to you for the same question. Yeah, thank you, Blair. I, I guess um, congrats to Christina and Selena for that su you know such quick adaption to you know the crisis that we all faced. And I guess I was in the same position um, as you girls. You know, you get hit overnight with having a bricks and mortar business, um, which is then completely shut down. You know, we were fortunate that we had been developing out our own software, our own platform, our own app. Um, so you know, just uh, like these guys. We quickly moved to become to go from a bricks and mortar business to an online business. Um, I guess the biggest challenge, or we probably as a company repositioned it as the biggest opportunity, was how do we keep the same connection? Because group fitness, fitness in general, should all be about the end product. How do we make that consumer feel better about themselves? Um, how do we maintain that over the period of the unknown? Because at that stage, we didn't know if it was two weeks, two months, six months, twelve months. Um, so how do we keep connection, how do we keep communication and how do we keep um, really solid community, which um, Fitstop is known for. So it was, um, it was an exciting challenge. Um, and I'm really proud that as a, as a group, as a unit, um, you know, we trusted and believed that we could get through it. Um, you know, and, and obviously we're still going through it, but um, yeah, it was a very, very interesting time. Great to hear you persevered through it, my friend, and kept the brand strong. Uh, over to you now, Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Blair. Um, for us, I think the biggest challenge, and this goes across industry, is the uncertainty. And you know, Selena and Peter mentioned this also. But you know, when this when this thing kicked off back February, March, depending on which country or territory we're in, for us at least, it was going to be a two week shutdown. Uh, we thought it would be a you know a short break. We'd all get back to life as usual. And then in the second week, it was going to be three weeks, and then it was going to be four weeks, and you know, we're still in this uncertainty stage. We don't know if a second wave is going to come. We don't know if lockdowns are going to happen again and closures. So I think, and this affects again, every industry, it's just this uncertainty of not knowing how long it's going to go on for and what's going to, how we're going to emerge from it has really been a struggle. But I think we've done pretty well through it. 
And the uncertainty is not just within our operations, but it's within fit out works and what happens to our contractors and what happens to our trainers. And especially in this region that relies heavily on travel within the region and internationally, you know, international flights have been locked down. I took my first flight in seven months last week. I think pr prior to that, I've been traveling, you know, up to five, six flights a week for the last 10 years. So it's been a big change for us and, and for the region, but, uh, we hope and we see some uh, some return to normal, and uh, we're, we're hoping and, and we're glad that uh, entering entering the next phase. So that's been the biggest challenge for us. It's great to hear. We are looking towards the Middle East, and hopefully, and the progress and, and not even more, just like the Pacific future. Uh, Sam, lastly, for this question, do you have some uh, insights? Thanks, Blair. I'll, uh, I'll quickly touch on the people. I know revenue, of course, and people towards digital and ultimately tweaking our business model is something we've all had to deal with. But something that's a little bit softer and I think has been hammered home at class class over the last few months is the importance of our people and our staff and the importance of everybody's mental health in a time where we had this once in a generation exogenous event that's completely out of our control. We had staff in 30 countries around the world and we are really unfortunately i'm sure everybody in this panel has gone through the same thing we had to lay off or furlough several hundred close to 50 percent of our staff and then you have this situation where the people remaining have lost their mates there's this externality that is uncontrollable and motivation is a question inspiration is a question and just engagement is a question the other thing is how do you get any sense of impact when the goalposts are shifting seemingly day on day on day. You sort of set yourself on one direction and then the next week that changes completely. So I guess the macro learning for, for us at a class pass, and I sound like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, but this idea of a stoic philosophy of accepting what is in our control and really highlighting that and letting go of anything that's not in our control and not suffering in imagination as opposed to reality. Because I think I was certainly sucked into this. I had markets in my room in like Hong Kong was so exciting and it, it was looking like it was all going to open up and then I was very attached to this and then Hong Kong broke my heart with his second wave and we were back to completely locked down. So it's a great reminder that ultimately happiness is reality minus expectations, keep the expectations relatively level and control what we can control, which is our attitude and our approach to what we're doing at this time. And for us at Class Bus, that's really helped with everybody's overall sense of well-being in the business. And of course, we've been extra lenient with days off and, and making sure our staff have access to counselling and, and mental health support when needed, because it's, I mean, unequivocally, this is an incredibly odd and disconcerting time. And we have to be really empathetic to the people in our businesses. Thank you, Sam, for that. That's great. I'm now going to move on to the next question for the panel. The emerging customer trends that you are seeing that influence how uh, and where you want to grow your business. Uh, and I'll go back to Christina to start this off. Christina. Yeah, so the one thing that actually excites me about this hard time, right? Every time there's a time of struggle or anytime there's like a dramatic shift in the macro environment is you see a lot of people start experimenting. You really see a lot of people trying different things, throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. So the things that I've been eyeing really excite me. It's really three things and it's really pertinent to us in boutique. One, it's really about everything I'm seeing now is about how do you get your wellness fix at home and how do you make it as convenient as possible um, to all your clients out there? So how do you keep providing good quality content and how do you vary up your content every single day? Because it can get really monotonous doing the same thing um, from your house every day. Um, Second is how do you make sure they have the hardware that they need to continue working out at home? And you also have to keep in mind your software as well. How do you keep giving them these quality classes in a really, really professional way? Um, so this wellness fix for me at home is really about um, players really focusing on how to blend their hardware, their software, and their content all together to really 
provide a willing, a very compelling package to their clients. Uh, the second trend I'm seeing is cross-training. I know before 2020, we already started seeing this, um, but I think now more than ever, I'm seeing a lot of boutiques offer more than one modality to their customer, um, simply because it is very monotonous to do just one workout every day. Um, so that really gets me excited because now I'm really seeing people prioritize their health. They're prioritizing strength training. They want to do more cardio. They just want to be healthier um, to make sure that they are good to go um, to, 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 to just continue living a healthy life, even if they're stuck at home. Uh, the last thing I'm starting to see now is really moving moving a lot of workouts outdoors so i think just recently like equinox in new york city they just opened their first outdoor gym um in manhattan and that's really exciting to see i'm also seeing a lot of boutique players reopen by doing um their classes outside uh, this is something electric has always done since we've opened we've always had these big outdoor events but now i'm seeing it as more of something we potentially might have to do not one time big time but something we might have to do to just really excite the market again and to get people to feel safe and to feel happy and to see the community once again so i think those are the big trends i'm personally eyeing and i'm really excited about thank you very much christina for that selena over to you now for the same question Um, I'll probably start with a standard answer around just keeping awareness of technology and developments. Um, as I said, it's not our primary um, service or business. However, how technology can help us better communicate with clients, find them, whether it's through social media and where they're actually talking, how we can have a better and more effective cut through. So keeping an eye on where and how we talk to our clients is really important. We did launch a new app this year. So to Christina's point, making sure that there is relevant content. But again, it's about adding value to the existing proposition that we have. It's got to be adding value. It's not primary. Um, I'm also very aware of, in my mind, it's the market getting younger. So when we talk about the aging market, but we do know now that a 55 year old is fitter and stronger than they've ever been. Their um, you know, desire to try new forms of fitness, to take on marathons, to invest in their own health and well-being is really quite significant and it's a growing market. So our market is getting younger. So when we look at who our target audience is, what is that potential now? Who is going to consider, you know, the consideration base actually come to KX in the first place? Really important to look at that and not be really fixated on one particular group, but who now is more likely to want to come and try a different form of workout that they wouldn't have experienced before. Um, and another one I wanted to flag is that of the celebrity trainer. And I don't necessarily mean an existing celebrity delivering a workout because they've already got the following and they've just got people following. I think the real rise of rock stars from within a fitness brand is really interesting to watch. Um, and we actually see that within KX already. Our trainers, again, are the core of what we offer and what we deliver. That's why clients choose to go to a particular class or maybe choose not to because they're following a trainer. And as we saw the, the four walls come down and we saw clients being able to book into trainer classes interstate to be honest, even internationally people were booking into kx classes here in australia trainer followings started to happen so i think again really recognizing the power of our own rock star trainers and growing trainers organically and really supporting them. they are the heroes of our brand that's something that, that excites me because that again is really core to what the, the kx service is all about Excellent, thank you. Great points, Selena and also Christina. Uh, can we uh, have your views on this, Nathan? Sure, I think, you know, from an operator perspective, there's a lot of cool things happening on digital, as people have talked about, and also on the outdoor workouts. I think these are exciting for me to see and to track because any new idea from an operator perspective, I think it's great to see how they're engaging with their members. And it's very unique from one market to the next. I mean, the dynamics in New York City right now are quite different from the dynamics that we're seeing here or even elsewhere in the US. Um, from a member perspective, I think you're seeing, of course, more people start engaging online. You're seeing people 
Now, we used to say boutiques are about millennials, but it's, as Selena mentioned, it's not a millennial business anymore, if it ever was to begin with. Um, but also people are finding new ways to engage with friends and family through boutique fitness, through fitness offerings online, which is cool to see. Uh, and also people are experimenting and trying out classes that they would never have had the opportunity to try before. You know, from where I sit today, I could do, you know, a rumble class in the US, I could do a, you know, a class from Asia, I could do a class from the UK. I, you know, I, I can sample thousands of studio offerings from my home. And so I'm, I'm engaging, I, I have the ability as a consumer to engage with brands that I never have before. Um, so this is interesting and then the implications for us, you know, we strongly believe as a business in brick and mortar. This is uh, the heart and soul of our business. We think this is the heart and soul of fitness. You can never replicate the in-person experience. And I think this is what really from the beginning, what separated boutique fitness from big box fitness is the personal connection and the, the, the relationships you can create with your community. So I think this will always be there. This is what we're going to double down on coming out of the pandemic. Because um, the other thing for us too, going back to my point about engaging with multiple brands, when you start competing digitally, you're not just competing with and, and delivering a service to your members, you're competing now with anybody who's offering a digital proposition, right? We've seen what Apple has announced, we've seen what everybody announced, uh, Lulu's acquisition of Mirror. I mean, there's so much happening in the industry and you can kind of quickly lose sight of your core proposition, you know? And I think it's gonna take a lot of time, resource and money to develop a really strong digital proposition. So you need to, every operator and us included needs to find what's that right balance between having some digital, but also not trying to do so much that you you dilute everything that you offer. Um, so that's kind of really where, where we stand. Fantastic point, Nathan, thank you for that. Uh, let me come to uh, Pete next. Any Anything not touched on by Christina, Selena and Nathan you want to point out in this regard? Look, I think the um, the big thing we looked at was um, if you look at a consumer's behavior or their routine, that was really broken. It was forced to be broken through lockdown. Um, people, just like these guys said, people started to, I guess, experiment with at their fingertips. What fitness do I want to do? Do I want to do Rumble? Do I want to do KX? Do I want to come and try FitStop? Um, where we're seeing that translate back into the bricks and mortar, which is, which is what we do and what we do well, um, is people are now more willing to do that trial session. They're, they're willing to grab their friends and family and bounce between gyms. So, you know, that can be seen as a negative, but it can also be a, a huge positive. It means, you know, we get that first impression, uh, that first experience on many new people. And if you've got um, an awesome customer experience and a great journey through your onboarding platform, then um, you're gonna be miles in front. So that's what we're really focused on is really upping that personalized service for that uh, that first initial contact, everything from downloading our app, really simple touch points to be purchasing, um, you know, giving the consumer um, their right to be able to pause sessions or cancel and, uh, and change things at their fingertips because that's what they've just experienced. Quite personalization there from Pete, uh, wonderful. And uh, Sam, to build on anything there? Sure. So my view is that, you know, macro COVID has been this great reprioritization for people. And that is actually going to prove out to be incredibly helpful for fitness. I see you smiling, Blair. It sounds like I've drunk a lot of Kool-Aid, and I really believe this. And the surveys that we do with our community across the world, this is coming through loud and clear. So people are talking about valuing experiences more so post-COVID. The idea of travel is more exciting than ever. The idea of looking after their health, both physical, mental, spiritual, is very exciting. Connecting people in person with family and friends. I'm not saying it rebounds straight away, back open, we're up to maybe 50 or 60% of pre-COVID reservation volume. So it's trickling back. But come 2021, when a vaccine is found, people are going to be less focused on materialism, less focused on fast fashion, less focused on spend, on fleeting purchases and things, and genuinely focused on fitness, which is going to be you know, a building block to a better life for them. So we're seeing that loud and clear in a lot of research we're doing across the world. And then a couple of quick statistics that are really interesting from, from our end is that we're seeing about two thirds of people saying that post COVID, they're going to work out in a hybrid model. So you're looking at a combination of digital and in-person, very few people are saying, I only want to work out in person. So about two thirds are saying some digital at some point as an adjunct to my in-person fitness, as well as the in-person fitness. And then maybe the most exciting stat for everybody here, 
We, we had a survey the other day where 80% of our users told us that they plan to work out as much as they did pre-COVID, post-COVID, and the other 20% said they plan to work out more. So we had literally like, a nominal amount, less than 1% of people who said, I'm going to work out less in a post-COVID world. So what are the implications for us? I think our target addressable market is probably expanded, to be honest, as an industry, to Selena's point and Pete's point about, and, and Nathan as well. I think maybe millennial centricity is gone. People are more conscious of being able to experience boutique fitness no matter their age. And the last thing is that I think Pete definitely 100% agree with what you were saying around the quality that you now need to provide, a frictionless experience, good UX and good UI on your digital uh, products. And COVID is a change agent. It's not so much a change agent as an accelerant. If your products were stale and tired and unmoving and antiquated pre-COVID, you might have had 10 years worth of that business slowly fizzling out. Now your business is going to quickly be expedited into its demise, which is actually, I think, a good thing for our industry. It means that the cream can rise to the top, consumers can get the best quality studio fitness experiences instead of having to put up with something which may have been acceptable in the in the 80s or 90s, but is no longer going to cut it now. So I'm actually pretty bullish on what we're seeing, Blair, in case you can't tell. <laughs> I think it's, it's great points, and it really brings together the next question for, for all the panel, which essentially is that when we move from just us surviving the pandemic mindset to growing the business and actually expanding it, moving past the pandemic, what are the strategies and the offerings to the marketplace that we in Boutique Fitness need to provide in order to thrive, not just survive? And I'll start this off with uh, Selena first, if you don't mind. Sam, I think you absolutely nailed it there because whether it is a brand itself which is falling behind or within a existing brand, it's really important that every single person takes that responsibility to make sure as a boutique experience, the client is getting that specialized, personalized boutique experience. And if we can't live up to that, yes, they will go and look somewhere else. So, you know, that has to be really important. A, understanding and knowing your um, clients, being true to that brand, delivering the expectation of the client. I think again, right now we can absolutely see we have half the network in survival mode, half the network in growth mode. So we've got that confidence, I think, oh, sorry, I can't remember who said it, but we've got the confidence around fitness and wellness coming back. I think that was you, Christina, um, and the experience. People are, I love that. They're hungry for the experience, getting back into studio. Screen fatigue is real. This is a uh, quote that we talk about within HQ. People don't want to keep going to the screens. I absolutely agree. I think there'll be a, a hybrid of the two. And if anything, we'll have people who are already fit, yes, doing more, but not compromising that in-studio experience. So our number one goal is getting our studios back open, back to their full potential. And we as we as well, we're, we're growing, we're evolving in Australia. We've still got markets we really want to concentrate growth on. We're quite we're saturated really in Victoria. A lot of growth in New South Wales, a lot of growth potential for, for WA and Queensland. So that's really exciting. And I think the post-COVID um, comeback to fitness really supports that. So yes, um, go back to brand, knowing who we are and what we want to be able to deliver to our, our clients. Thank you very much for that, Selena. Great points. Uh, Christina, can you build on that at all? Yeah, sure. So first of all, if you're already out of survival mode, huge, huge congratulations <laughs> to you. Um, I, I'm going to be honest, we are one foot in the door for certain in that survival mode, but that other foot is always looking long term. So similar to Selena, I think for boutique most especially, the thing you have to um, build your growth strategy on is really how do you keep strengthening that strengthening that community how do you continue to make them feel special even if right now you're operating in a virtual world mm -hmm. i mean today you don't have that same luxury as you know greeting a person face to face or you know making them feel special by you know creating that you know note card that you could put in their locker those things are you know, sad to say gone for now, but there's definitely a way to keep making your customers feel special, even virtually. Um, you really have to keep thinking of them and how do you keep making your brand 
presence felt. So for us with electric, um, everything we, we do even now in this crazy time is really community focused. So we always think of, okay, what partnerships can we do that will excite people? Um, how do you create these FOMO moments so that people who are in your community feel good about being part of it and people who are not part of their community, once they see you know, all that content that you're putting out there or, or your community is putting out there, they feel like, oh, I should have attended that event. I should have attended that class. And they really want to belong to that. So I think it's really, always thinking about how do you remind them of why they fell in love with you and why they fell in love with your brand. And as long as you have that as your focus, your long-term growth strategy will be fine if that's at its core. Thank you, Christina. That's great. Nathan? Sure. Thanks, Claire. I might break this down into two two parts, kind of short-term growth and longer-term growth. Mm -hmm. uh, from a short-term growth perspective, I think, at least for us, um, there's an aspect of kind of perception management, and this has been talked about in previous panels and sessions. Um, but really, as, as we get back open, as we get to regrowing our industry and our business, we still need to maintain uh, perception within our communities and within government to make sure that boutique fitness and fitness in general is perceived as a safe and healthy way uh, to kind of boost, boost immunity and it, you know it's not any less risky than or not any more risky than a restaurant or different types of venues in, in many ways it's much more secure so i think you know this is necessary especially as countries are starting to talk about second wave and second closures if we're not managing perception then we're exposing ourselves to a, a very real near-term risk. And then I think second in the near term is, is member safety. Um, I think this is critical to lay the foundation for our next stage of growth. We need to make sure that when members come back to our facilities, to the bricks and mortar, that not only they, they are safe, but they feel safe. And uh, you know if they, if they feel unsafe or if they feel exposed to some un unnecessary risk when they revisit the studio for the first time, I think either you've you've lost that member or you're going to struggle to get them to come back the next time um especially when there's competition in the market and everybody's kind of doubling down on member safety and hygiene and things like this and people are now exposed to multiple brands so they've been trying different offerings if they come on the first day back and they're not comfortable with what you're doing they may be more uh, open to trying somebody else um in the longer term i think two big things i think one um, as an industry, it's revenue diversification. So if we have all of our eggs in one basket, which is you know selling clap passes for people to come into our clubs, just like the movie theater industry that we've seen recently, you know what's happening in the UK and the US, and I'm sure everywhere else, they're shutting down. If we continue to 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 live and die by the you know twenty dollar class access, then I think if a, as the next pandemic happens, I think we're just going to be back in the same situation. So let's learn from this diversify our revenue streams, whether that's through digital, as a lot of people are doing, or uh, other new opportunities. I think that's something that we need to think about. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the other thing really is um, disaster planning. I think this is something that exists in other industries. We haven't historically done this. We didn't think there was a need to, um, but I think there is a value in creating kind of a disaster management strategy within HQ whether you have one studio or a hundred studios. So everything is quite clear from day one. If something happens, we know what's gonna happen from member communications, from, from programming, from execution, uh, hundreds of things. So, you know, we saw through this pandemic the first two, three months, even now still, people are trying to figure out how, what the best approach is, right? What trainers to put in front of the camera because the best trainers in the club aren't the best trainers in front of a camera. Um, the best ways to communicate with members. So we've learned through this, let's get it uh, formalized and let's make sure as an industry and as individual operators, we're, we're more structured and set up to deal with it if it happens again and hope, hopefully it won't. We all, we all hope that uh, certainly the audience will chime that same uh, sentiment. I'm just gonna ask uh, Pete and Sam, we are running a little bit low on time. So if you could quickly, Pete and then Sam answer the same question. 
Yeah, no worries. I'll keep it short then. I think um, the big thing we're focusing on is don't be all things to all people. Um, really understand who your market is, who your consumer is. And for us, that's our members and then our franchise partners. We're a franchise group, so we've got to make sure that we're constantly servicing both um, and we're doing the, the best job we possibly can to support and service them. So like Sam said, the cream will rise to the, um, to the top and uh, we absolutely want to be there. Very much, Pete. And Sam, lastly for you, what's uh, strategies to thrive rather than survive? Okay, three really quick things from me, Blair. So, and, and this is you know, going to sound like a, a you know, glorified class pass sales speech, but variety and flexibility, even outside of class pass, is so key. You know, it's probably about prioritizing short term cash flow as opposed to locking in long term memberships, which some businesses in fitness, that is a wholesale change for them. Think about how disorientated people are at the moment. Think about how tough it is to commit a day ahead with, you know, is your kid going to come out of school? Are you going to potentially lose your job or have to relocate to a different office? So the idea of setting long-term packs, I think, has become much tougher. So prioritizing short-term sales with variety and flexibility, putting the people first, as in your community, the people who are coming into your studio. I know Christina, Peter, Selena, you guys are absolutely best practice at this, but it still astonishes me how many people say, oh, I spent $2 million on a fit out. I've got Dyson hair dryers and ASOC products. Everyone's gonna come. That is not true. The biggest misnomer in fitness is that. Now, people, community, people by people, people refer their friends. Your LTV on a referral is 10X somebody who clicks on an ad that you serve them on digital. So prioritizing people. And then the last thing, which is quite interesting in a bricks and mortar business is really thinking about probably, especially Pete and Selena with your franchising is the demographics and the exact areas with which you're looking at different locations. Because we know that up to maybe 30% of our Asia Pacific clients at ClassPass are actually living in a different postcode compared to when they started pre-COVID. So you think about there used to be this, these homogenous blobs of demand, which was before work, after work, lunchtime. People are not going into offices, people are working out nearer to where they live in the suburbs. So in America, for example, we're seeing a huge trend towards those second tier cities, which attract more youthful people. So a Portland or outside of Silicon Valley or New York, they're, they're moving, they can work remotely, and the leasing is much cheaper for fitness brands to go into. So really exploring, is it worth paying your CBD lease because CBD foot traffic, unless you can get a sweetheart deal from a landlord, is never going to recover, maybe, maybe ever, or certainly not for the foreseeable future. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Uh, we're going to move on to our little addition to what we've just talked about now, and that is which technology or which new investment would each of the panelists make for their brand going forward? I'll try to get you to each keep this to a 30 second answer if you can. So going to Selena first, what would you say for this? Um, funny enough, I will keep it very quick. Um, as CEO, I will keep an eye on what is happening. Nathan, you talked about Mirror. We're looking at Apple Fitness. Yes, there's a lot going on in terms of shaking up the market of fitness and they're all bringing in Pilates offerings. But I don't want to be scared or put off by that. So at the same time, keeping an eye on it. But then again, going back to what we're delivering in studio. Same for smart technology, how that's coming into equipment, how smart technology is getting into apparel. I mean, it's really quite mind blowing what's available. But with all of this also comes disruption, doesn't suit everybody. It's got to really work and enhance the client experience for it to add value. So again, going back to what we're concentrating on right now, we need to be very aware of how technology can help us better un understand our clients' needs, using data to make really smart decisions and target the right people and keep them there. So again, just really developing what we can do from a loyalty and a retention side so that we're really val adding value to our clients. Excellent. Thank you, Selena. Nathan, for you, what's the top technology investment you're going to launch next? Uh, for us, I, I don't think it's a, any new technology. I think maybe it goes back to what Peter was saying. It's about uh, refining our, our, our own digital solutions to refine our core proposition and strengthen our core proposition, which is bricks and mortar. We're not going aggressively into online digital space um only to the extent that it maybe can reinforce what we're doing in the club um our app of course uh, refining this and making it stronger to make the member experience more seamless 
Um, on a global scale, we'll continue to see, I think, more consolidation and partnerships form. On a regional level, we might see uh, partnerships form between different boutique brands and can com combine their digital, digital strength. But for us as a business, we're just focusing again on brick and mortar and from a technology perspective, just strengthening what we already have to make sure that we're delivering on our customer promise. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, obviously, Pete, you're very data-driven in the business. How would you answer this question? Yes, yeah, uh, we touched on it before, but uh, we own our own technology platform um, and develop it out. For us, it's all about that consumer experience. Um, and we track the data based off that acquisition and the retention piece. So um, we're going to keep doing that, keep focusing on that. Outside of that, there's some exciting things happening in the space. Um, and I'd love to start plugging into those exciting things, not become that exciting tech company. Pete, you this question very brief. Yeah, so for us, uh, we really believe that the in-studio experience will come back and it will come back strong. But we also believe that customer behavior has changed, so the home experience will continue to stay as well. So for us, we've actually been um, investing a lot in our technology and how we can have that holistic customer experience and customer view of really the in-studio and the home studio, as we call it, and really getting that data and getting that customer behavior and getting that holistic data we could get out of that. So for us, it's really about tracking that customer journey, whether they're working out at home or in our studio. Thank you, Christina. And lastly, Sam? I'm staggered more fitness studios and not taking a bigger leaf out of mainland China's book. Bear with me here. I know that's a big sentence. There's uh, a particular brand in mainland China called Super Monkey that I think everybody should have a look at. Super Monkey, I see Selena nodding. Super Monkey is the sexiest fitness brand in China. It's a hit concept, it's an open gym concept, and every single aspect of that experience is contactless. It's an app and it's a QR code to enter the gym. They will never hire a front desk person. Everything is accessible through the app. You enter your locker through the app, you get your towel through the app, you access your shower through the app, you can even sync in with your gym equipment to log your calories and other uh, statistics through the app. The only headcount within SoupMonkey in Shanghai and Beijing is a, a really good quality staff member to take studio fitness classes and they run maybe 10 a day. So their OPEX is significantly lower. I mean, I've heard uh, studios paying $5,000 a month in towel service alone in, in markets like Singapore, for example. So being able to cut OPEX while simultaneously increasing the safety in any studio, decreasing the touch points human to human in a COVID world, and increasing the real touch points that matter, which is high quality instructors in a studio fitness class. I'm, I, I cannot see a world in which that sort of technology is not widely used across wider Asia and certainly the world, because I think Super Monkey is at the absolute cutting edge and they've been a runaway success story during COVID. We've heard anecdotally that they've tripled their subscriber base in the last six months and they're opening, you know, they're selling studios like Hotcakes. So, have a, have a look at them if anybody hasn't. Very exciting brand, a great, great uh, point to that. I'm going to touch on another question again, just a very quick uh, answer from this panel so that we can move on to the next question. Where would you like to see future collaborations in the boutique industry and the wellness ecosystem? And what new value can we unlock when we do things together? And I'll come to Christina first, just 30 seconds on this, Christina, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I think we're starting to see it already. And that's one thing that's been great about the situation is I think even it locally, even if um, we are competitors, I think this has just broken all those barriers, barriers and we're constantly working together, boutique and big box. What I'd love to see more of is really collaboration between countries. Um, you know, now you are not limited by the studio. So I could take a class in Hong Kong, someone from Singapore can take class um, with us in the Philippines. So I really think there's a lot of synergies there that we just have not untapped, that we haven't tapped. And I'm super excited to bring more value to the community by having that kind of collaboration. I think it's a unique, unique experience we can take advantage of right now. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Nathan, to you next. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a cheeky way out. I would say, where could we not benefit from collaboration in the industry? 
right? It, it should happen everywhere. Uh, I think competition really only exists because we let it. We've all talked about the fact that the market overall is growing, fitness is expanded, the opportunity is much greater, in fact, than it, than it was before. Um, so we should be collaborating uh, across across the industry, across geographies. Um, yeah. As much as we can, my friend. That's that's great. Yeah. Pete, on to you for this. Hey, look. Um, again, I'll keep it nice and simple. I think we're here today to to hopefully um, teach people that are interested in boutique fitness. So my biggest piece of advice here is reach out to other people in the boutique space. Um, you know, drop me a line on Instagram, um, ask questions, ask more and more questions to learn. Um, and that's how we can all really not only survive, but thrive through this time. Thank you, Pete. Do audience connect with each one of the panelists and ultimately ask them who they should connect with. It's a very powerful uh, tool to do that. Uh, Sam, I'm going to move to you this and then after that, Selena. I feel like you teed up this, this question for me. So obviously uh, any sort of fitness studio that is looking to fill latent demand within their business, any, any business in any context has a demand curve. Of course, the top, the middle, you've got your direct members, you've got your walk-ins. The bottom of that curve, no matter how good you are, is going to be unfilled. If you are not using an aggregator such as ClassPass, as Selena knows, to help fill that demand, you are leaving tens of thousands of dollars on the table. So genuinely, if ClassPass is something that you've considered in the past or maybe you don't know enough about it, we have done as much as we can throughout this pandemic to help our studio partners to maximize their revenue and to market them as much as possible. Things like we, we can crunch the numbers and help inform your scheduling because we know that peak and off-peak do not look how they used to look. We can help out with CapEx. We can, you know, ultimately we just exist to give incremental revenue to as many studio partners as possible. We will not cannibalize your business. We are a marketing tool that helps you fill the bottom of your demand curve. And we have an incredible team in Asia and the world who, who can help you guys. So Christina, I know we talked for a long time. Let's make it happen in Manila. It can't just be <laughs> studios on ClassPass. Pete, same thing. I've had about uh, getting your fit stop locations on. I know there's been a lot of demand from your franchisees, but we're, we're here to help. Even, even if it's not to partner, even if you just are interested in our data, 30,000 partners across the world, uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, if there's any trend that you guys want to dig into or any analysis that we can help with, we're always happy to, to dig it out for you and assist. Thank you, Sam. That's great. And over to you now, Selena. What's the one that sticks out for you? Um, look, again, at the end of the day, our number one focus is our clients and making sure they are getting the results that they want. Um, for a lot of clients, they are KXs and something else. They might be runners, cyclists, swimmers. How KX help them to become a better runner, a better swimmer, better weightlifter? That's really important. We actually really celebrate the fact that KX can work alongside other fitness brands and we welcome fitness partnerships already. So I think that's always been quite unique. We really want to try and open up and work with um, other fitness and wellness solutions. And again, knowing, uh, I guess, being 10 years old, Aaron, when he founded KX, Aaron's gone through KX Cycle, KX Yoga, KX Bar. Going back to making sure we are really, really specialists at what we do and then working with other specialists and together being able to offer our clients the best experience. So not trying to take on too much, diversify too much, we do our thing really, really well, and we'll find other partners who can help service the needs of the clients. Thank you, Selena, for that. Last question for all the panel. And again, we'll keep this brief. We've only got five minutes. So you've got literally uh, 30 seconds each on this. And it's from uh, Julian Barnes and Yeto Etu. And that is ultimately, what is the future outlook for the boutique fitness industry over the next few years? What do you see? And I'll start off with you, Pete, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Look, um, for us, we're, we're really excited to, um, to really fine tune our product. And what we're excited about for the boutique space is it's really highlighting right now the importance of that personalized service in the group environment. And I think if we stay really true to that, we're just going to keep enhancing that with technology um, and be able to kind of really grow up and scale. And um, as an Australian company, um, you know, I'm sure Selena's excited about this as well. For us to be able to expand globally um, and show more people what we're passionate about, um, I think there's a huge opportunity for it. Nathan, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm biased, like perhaps we all are, but I'm extremely bullish about the long-term opportunity in boutique fitness. 
this is uh, the simple answer. I think there will be a lot of short-term pain and I, I really feel for those that are going through it globally uh, for whatever reason, you know, perhaps the strength of your offering or just happen to be your cash position coming into the pandemic. I mean, it's really unfortunate what's happening to uh, and what everybody is going through. Um, but I think we will get through the short-term pain and there is a lot of opportunity uh, for us going forward. And Christina, anything from you? Yeah, I mean, I'm very positive about fitness. That's not going away. And you could see, um, you know, Apple coming in, Amazon coming in. That's just proof of that. But I think with that growth, there will be consolidation and it will be painful for a lot of people. Um, I think the few, few, I think a few will survive. Um, I think the ones with the biggest um, connection with their community, the strongest brands, the ones that will evolve the fastest, they will survive this. Um, and I think you just really need to focus on what makes your brand you and not get lost into um, everything everyone's doing because um, that's going to be detrimental to your brand. Focus on your brand, focus on what you're known for and just build on that and you'll be okay. Wonderful brand Darwinianism from Christina there. Uh, Selena, from you next. Yeah, I agree with what everybody has said. And I think the power of boutique right now is that really small, personalized, contained environment. People have got that fear factor of going to a, a bigger environment, which might be, um, to say, less supervised. We can make sure that there is that trainer, there is that um, staff member on site who really can check in with every single person in that studio. We know that the cleaning is happening. We know the state and wellness of clients. So it's actually a really great opportunity to have a boutique studio at this time because we can give clients that, that peace of mind. And to Pete's point, you know, we've got a lot of growth here in Australia. We've, we would love, and we've got KX already. The, the reason I know Super Monkey Sam, we've got um, our first studio in China will open in Shanghai later this year. So we've seen that potential for boutique fitness, um, very much um, just, you know, the, the clients who are here in Australia, America, finding that client again, that client who really appreciates and understands what we can offer. We can't be everything to everybody, but those clients globally are there. So really taking advantage of that as well. Excellent. And lastly, Sam. So Haki Maximum two key themes from the start. COVID, great reprioritization. We're going to expand our target addressable market because people will prioritize health over pretty much anything when they come out of, that, out of this, which is wonderful. And then the other point is that this is an accelerant, not a change agent. Boutique fitness over the last 10 years has boomed. There is no doubt that it's going to continue to boom and actually be supercharged off of the back of this. So I'm extremely bullish. I just think it's a matter of sort of riding out the short-term pain Interestingly, the, the biggest determinant that we're seeing across the world in terms of whether a, a studio location closes or stays open is a commercial leasing. So maybe a sweetheart deal with the landlord or sort of being slightly cheeky and asking for forgiveness not permission with rent potentially might help you in the short term. And then one other thing as well is thinking about the volume of distressed assets that there is going to be in studio fitness across the world. You look at America, if anybody on this thread or, or listening has ever thought about a time to go to America, there has never been a better time. We have Flywheel bankrupt, we have New York Sports Clubs, Chapter 11, we have landlords scrambling to have fitness tenants as opposed to pizza shops or F&B filling the spaces. So if you've ever thought about international expansion, I, I'm genuinely bullish on businesses in the Southern Hemisphere with the balance sheets to actually go to the Northern Hemisphere and expand their brand more widely, more internationally. So, so maybe out of COVID, we get a bigger Asia Pacific footprint, which is very exciting. Thank you very much, Sam, for that. Uh, audience, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this panel. I'd just like to take stock now and thank Christina and Selena and Nathan and Pete and Sam for all their contributions, which have been utterly fantastic. Uh, we are going to close this session off very soon. So thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to the audience for engaging. I'd like to ask the audience uh, in a few minutes to move on to either the networking or go on to our fantastic expo. Virtua Gym are going to be on the main stage at 3.15 uh, and then everything is going back to networking and expo at 4, 4 o'clock. I, I really uh, want to thank all the panelists for what they've contributed now. We've got one last minute left. 
Uh, and what I'd like to ask each of the panel in closing is just for a single catchphrase, uh, what would you leave our audience with as a catchphrase going forward? And I'll start off with uh, Pete. Look, we use this during COVID um, and we would say to everyone, what do you want to be known for 30 days post COVID? We consistently say that, um, you know, do what's right, um, stay integral uh, and keep moving forward. Excellent. Sam, catchphrase? I'll come back to you. Uh, Selena? Very, very technical difficulties. I couldn't figure out to uh, unmute. I would just say, don't suffer in imagination rather than reality. Don't sort of suffer before it's necessary and, uh, and, and sort of try and focus on what you can control. That's a very long catchphrase, but uh, you get the sentiment. Excellent. Christina? Go to market quick, evolve. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just iterate along the way. Uh, Selena? Um, the only thing certain in life is death and taxes, and therefore we must embrace change. <laughs> very good, very good. Nathan? Uh, focus on the opportunity. Nathan, get lost. Great, great. Uh, sorry, Nathan, go on. One more last point for you, Nathan. No, that, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and thank you for everyone for, for listening. Uh, panelists, if you don't mind, just take this last minute to include your details again on the chat so that everyone can reach out to you. I know you did so at the beginning. If you can do so now, that would be fantastic. Uh, we're going to close this session off, but you'll be able to see the panelists' uh, contact details in the chat very, very soon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'll hopefully see all of you in the networking in a few moments or in the expo if you're going to look at the new products and innovations therein. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I do hope you tune in to what Virtua Gym uh, are offering and the main stage sessions at the end. Thank you all very much. And speakers, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'll let you go off now and have a well-earned uh, refreshment. Take care, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you, Blair. Thank you very much. Bye.